So recently, I had an experience while I was at a friend's house alone watching his dog that inspired me to do another Home Alone themed video. I spend so much time reading stories of people's horrific experiences that I forget these things could happen to me too. In a bit of a different fashion, I'll tell that experience I had after the viewer submitted stories at the end of the video. A more positive experience I would also like to talk about is my experience with Scentbird, a fragrance subscription service that allows you to choose new designer fragrances to try out every month at an affordable price. You get to try the first fragrance from Scentbird for only $8, and your next month will be only $16.95. The vials are cheaper than a lot of the rollerballs or travel sizes you'll find elsewhere. Scentbird is a great solution for beginners in fragrance looking to experiment with certain scents. Scentbird allows you to try different designer fragrances from brands like Prada, Gucci, and Versace with a 30-day supply of any fragrance you choose. This way, if you're just getting into building your fragrance collection, you can test out what you like and what you don't without having to purchase a full bottle. Through Scentbird, I found my favorite scents, Eros Flame by Versace, which mixes Italian lemon, pink pepper, and vetiver for a classier scent, and Cross River Gorilla by Sanctuary for a more casual scent. So if you're looking to start your own collection, head on over to Scentbird by scanning my QR code using code 55NIGHTMARE to get 55% off your first month at Scentbird. Growing up, I was raised in rural Michigan. There was hardly anything to do. If you like staring at trees and crops and lots of alone time, that was the place to be. I got out of there as soon as I got a car and enough money to move. I'm not a nature hater or anything, but I'd pick being by a big city any day. My parents don't own that property anymore. They sold it five years ago, but to describe it, it was a three-acre property. The house itself was pretty big, and there was a storage building out back. I was 13 when this happened. My parents would leave me alone often at this age. They trusted me because I matured at a young age and I had responsibilities on the property. It was a weekend, and I was playing Vice City on my PS2 in the living room, when suddenly, a loud metallic bang came from outside somewhere in the yard. I right away ran to every window I could to look outside to see if I could see something, and I didn't see anything until I got to the window looking out to the storage building out back. The door to it was completely open. I went immediately to grab the rifle from the closet and go outside. I made my presence known, shouting who's in there, to no avail. When I got to the door, I made it known I had a gun before looking inside. There was a bunch of stuff in there, from the sit-down mower to the quad to infinite little lawn care items. Someone could have been hiding behind any of that stuff. Even as a kid, I didn't scare easily, but at that moment, I got really unsettled. And so I closed the door to the building and went back inside the house. I locked the door and then sat at the window for the longest time, watching the storage building, expecting the door to open at any second. That door was heavy and impossible to just open by itself. It was simply a fact that someone came and opened it. Whether they were still inside of the building, I wasn't sure. I decided to go call my dad and ask his opinion. I went to the kitchen to the landline phone and called my dad's cell phone. He didn't pick up, so I left a voicemail. This was back when you'd still have to leave someone a voicemail because texting wasn't mainstream. After that, I went back to sitting next to the window, but now I put on a TV show in the background to make this less monotonous. I took the phone with me. I was probably about to give up when I heard creaks from upstairs. My heart was now in my throat. I had to ask myself the big question, was I working myself up or was someone here? I had a serious guard dog mentality. Even if I didn't love that place, I saw it as mine, my family's. I had to protect it. But I was in over my head. I grabbed the rifle again and walked upstairs. I didn't say anything. Calling out would only make a potential intruder know that I heard them. I made it to the top of the stairs and I turned on the light for the upstairs hallway. There were five doors to open, all of them closed. Four led to bedrooms, one led to the bathroom. Each door had a decently large crack underneath that would allow you to see under. The creak in the ceiling I heard moments earlier came from the side of the house my parents' bedroom was on, so I got down on my knees and looked under the crack of the door, and I saw two bare feet facing the other side of the door. I felt my stomach twist into a knot. The reality of the situation just became so much more real, and I realized I wasn't ready to threaten or, God forbid, shoot someone. I got up and quickly went downstairs 
and I hid in the bathroom to call my dad. He still didn't pick up. I left another voicemail, and then I called again and again. He never picked up. He must have had his phone set down somewhere. I finally called 911, as I should have done right away, and I whispered into the phone the whole time, detailing exactly what was taking place. I was told to sit tight in the bathroom and not say a word. I heard footsteps coming down the stairs, and then they approached the bathroom door as if whoever it was somehow knew I went straight to the bathroom. The footsteps stopped outside the door, and there was a brief pause before a deep voice said, What's up, kid? I still remember the voice and those words so vividly. If I heard that voice today, I'd still recognize it immediately. I almost wanted to cry, that's how scared I was. I disobeyed what the operator told me and I spoke. I said loud and clear, I'm on the phone with the cops right now and I have a gun. I put the operator on speaker as she was asking me if everything's okay. The man attempted to open the door and when he realized it was locked, I heard him walk away. I heard the footsteps fade to silence and then the sound of a door slamming. It was the sound of the back door. I'm sure I breathed a sigh of relief and from there on, I waited for the police to arrive. When they did, I felt like a million pounds just lifted off my shoulders. After a thorough inspection of the house inside and out, confirming that the man was gone, they asked if there was anywhere else I could stay that night, and I said yes, my uncle's house. We contacted my uncle, who came and spoke with the police, then he took me back to his place. The thing that haunts me the most is that it was my fault. I could have prevented this. I left the door unlocked as I went to the storage building to investigate. Clearly, that's when the man simply walked right into the house. Even with a rifle in my hands, I didn't feel safe at all. It was truly the most horrific experience of my life. I was 18 when my parents went away on a week-long anniversary trip. My sister had already moved out by this point, so I had to hold the fort. My parents' property is enclosed by woods and a dirt driveway leading to the road. The road is a quiet back road with equally sized properties running alongside it, all of them separated a decent distance, so it's a really isolated feel up there. Everyone in town knows each other, you see familiar faces all the time for the most part. At the gas station, at the grocery store, at the bars, which I'd learned a few years later when I started going to them. Speaking of gas stations, this story starts one day while my parents were away. I was at a gas station filling up my tank when a black Jeep Cherokee pulled up to the pump next to mine. A man with a goatee stepped out, greeted me, and started filling his tank. In that town, it was normal for strangers to greet each other like that. He had his nozzle locked into the gas tank, and then he walked around to my side of the pump and went, Excuse me, do you know how to get to the interstate from here? I helped him to the best of my ability. He pulled out a notepad and started writing down the directions I gave him. Very odd how he wouldn't just do that on his cell phone like anyone else would. He thanked me and asked if I'm from the area. I said yeah, I grew up here, and he said he's from out of town. He didn't specify where. He then went back to his side and put the nozzle back in the pump. He then asked my name, as he said it's nice meeting you. I said my name's Kate. He said what a lovely name, and then got in his car as I got into mine. I drove out first and turned left to go up the road back home. It was only a few minutes worth of driving before I was approaching our turn into the driveway. I slowed down and put my blinker on, then turned right onto the property. It was at that moment that I noticed the car behind me was that same black Jeep Cherokee. He passed me as I turned into our driveway. He went the complete opposite way that I told him to go to get to the interstate. As he passed me, he didn't slow down or anything, so it seemed that maybe he just forgot the directions I gave him and went the wrong way. I let myself inside and went about the rest of my day doing whatever. I think it was that night that I was going out to meet up with my friends that I stepped outside and walked to my car and heard the sound of footsteps nearby. Like I said, the house is enclosed by woods and this was in the middle of the summertime. It could have been any number of animals, so I didn't investigate. I just got in my car and left, but when I got back home hours later and walked from my car to the house, a man's voice from out somewhere in the woods called out Kate. I got the chills as I looked around, and then in a panic rushed to open the front door. I slammed it shut and sat on the couch to breathe. 
The neighbors all knew my name, but the houses are not on top of each other, so it's a bit of a walk. And there was no reason for one of them to call my name like that like a creep and not identify themselves. I decided to call my parents to tell them, and their explanation was it must have been one of the neighbors, and they'll probably knock on the door. I didn't tell them about the encounter at the gas station. The next day, which was a Saturday, I stayed home most of the day, and later that night, I once again was going out to meet with my friends. After getting ready and everything, I went outside, and as I was walking to my car, I heard loud and clear from the not-so-far distance, someone call Kate again. This time, I didn't wait a second. I ran back inside the house and locked the door again. I called 911 this time, texting my family while doing so. After two cops showed up to the house, they looked around the perimeter of the property with their flashlights, then came back and said to call again if this persisted. I didn't feel much better after this, it's not really like they did much. I refrained from going outside until the next day when I had work. I was a server at a nearby restaurant. I was working a late shift. I left the house in broad daylight, paranoid to hear that voice again. Thankfully though, I didn't. Maybe seeing the police car finally scared them off. After many hours at work, I was ready to go home and collapse into bed. I pulled onto the property, parked my car out front, and walked to the front door. I stopped when I heard the sound of footsteps again. It didn't sound like an animal's footsteps though. I stood on the front deck for a second, waiting, and then that familiar voice yelled out again saying, Kate, don't call the cops on me again, cutie. I yelled out, you need help, you're sick, and let myself inside. I called the cops once more, and the cops came again, searched the perimeter again, and left. My parents told me I should stay at a friend's house for the night. I couldn't agree more. They would be back the following night, so after that, I would feel much safer being there. My friend Alex told me I could stay with her that night, so I packed a bag and was ready to go. I checked out the windows first to make sure the coast was clear. I then went outside and locked the door as fast as I could, then ran to the car. As I turned the key in the ignition, I heard something right to my left. Right outside the driver's side door was a man wearing a face mask trying to open the door. I couldn't even scream. I felt like I was choking on air. As I put the car in drive, he started hitting the glass with his elbow. I looped my car around on the grass and sped down the driveway, and I turned right up the road and didn't stop until I got to Alex's house. I was hysterically crying the whole drive there as I had Alex and her dad on the phone with me. He said he would have come and picked me up had he known the situation. We called the police together for a third time in total. A couple officers went to my parents' house to investigate again, make sure no windows were shattered or anything. One officer came to Alex's house where I once again gave my description of what happened. This was probably the most action these cops had seen in a long time in this quiet town. Thankfully, my parents came home the next day and I felt safe staying at home again. I fully believe the man at the gas station followed me home intentionally and scoped the place out, realizing I was by myself and for whatever reason toyed with me until he actually tried to pounce and get me. I shouldn't have given my real name and I should have been more alert to my surroundings and realized he was following me in my car that day. Some people are nuts and have way too much time on their hands. This incident was a huge motivating factor in my moving out to my own apartment a few months later. I was home alone one night for a reason I don't remember. All I remember is my entire family was gone. I was 15 or 16 years old. I was a big gamer at the time. I was obsessed with StarCraft and admittedly I'd sometimes spend a weekend night or two playing StarCraft or some other PC game. This was right before COVID lockdown started. I was playing StarCraft on my computer in my bedroom on the first floor. That's when the doorbell rang, twice. I hurried to the door, not wanting to be away from the game for too long in fear of losing. I got to the front door and said, who is it, as I always would if I was alone. A soft and weak voice on the other side said something that I couldn't hear. It sounded like a woman. I opened the door, with the storm door still separating me and this older woman standing on the other side, with a big smile on her face. She had her hands behind her back. I said through the door, can I help you? She said she needed to use a phone and asked if she could come inside. Ever since I was a little kid, I was always taught not to let a stranger into the house, ever. That included women. I felt so awkward though, I didn't know how to turn her away. 
I redirected her to the library a few blocks down because they'd surely have a phone. Deep down, I knew the library was closed at this point, but I was just trying to get the stranger who was trying to get into my house to leave. She was still smiling, but what she said next did not match her smile. She said, that's very rude to turn away an old lady asking for help. I replied the only way I could think to, and that was that my parents don't allow strangers into the house. It's a house rule. I slowly started closing the door as I was saying sorry, and she just stood there, not moving, but still smiling at me. And though her smile never changed, it suddenly felt much more menacing. I was walking back to my room when the doorbell rang again. There was no way in hell I was opening the door again. That woman radiated weird vibes from the start. Maybe something was wrong with her, maybe she wasn't all there. These were things I had no way of knowing, and maybe that was selfish of me to send her on her way. But I just wasn't opening the door for anyone when I was home alone. I went back to my game. Not too long after I sat back down, I heard something tapping on the window. It was a clinking type sound, from something metal. The window was directly in front of my desk. I had the blind pulled down so I couldn't see what was making the noise, but I already had an idea. My room was the only room with a light on in the house. The horrible thought that it was the old woman from just before, and that she walked over to my window, terrified me. I turned off the sound on my computer. At this point, I didn't care about my game anymore. The clinking sound on the window persisted. I basically said f this, and up and left to a different room in the house. I sat in the darkness of the living room for a bit, when the doorbell rang again. This woman was harassing me now. I tried to convince myself she wasn't a threat, just some crazy old woman who was probably clueless as to where she is. When she rang the doorbell a second and third time, I decided to go open the door and ask her if there's someone I could call for her. But when I opened the door, there was now a man on the other side. He looked to be about 10 years younger than her. He said through the storm door, have you seen my mother? I replied saying yes, she came to my door just before. He then apologized to me and said she has dementia and got out of the house. I suddenly felt bad, but he asked me if he could come in for a minute, and again I felt awkward. Why did he need to come inside? I said the same thing that I told to the woman who we claimed to be his mother. I said we could just talk through this door. I then said that I think she went into my backyard because I heard something at my window. I told him he could go around back and check. He thanked me and walked down the walkway, and I thought he went into the backyard. But when I went to the back and looked out the back window expecting to see him searching around, I saw nobody. Not him or his mom. This was all too weird for me. I went to bed on the earlier side that night, just falling asleep with the TV on in the background, until I heard the clinking sound on the window again. Something metal was tapping on the glass. I remembered the concerned man, and I decided to try and help. I went to the window, lifted the blind up with my hand, and I saw that woman outside my window, with that same creepy smile. She was tapping a kitchen knife on my window. I closed the blind and crawled back into my bed. This didn't feel like it was actually happening. A suspiciously short amount of time later, the doorbell rang like four times. The clinking on the window stopped by this point. This was all too suspicious, it felt like some kind of robbery attempt. I ignored the doorbell, I stayed in my bed. I was gonna wait this out. I didn't have a cell phone at this time, I wasn't the most social guy growing up. I also didn't want to call the police for some reason. I waited this all out until it finally stopped. The next morning, I told my dad what happened when I called him. He told me I was smart not to open the door. Everyone agreed that everything about it sounded like an attempted robbery. Is there a chance that maybe that woman really did have dementia and that the man was really her concerned son? Maybe, but it all seemed too coordinated. Why did he want to come into the house too? How did he even know she came to my house specifically? Why didn't he ever go into the backyard to look for her when I gave him permission to do so? Too many unanswered questions that lead me to believe I avoided something terrible happening if I opened that door. So as I mentioned at the start of the video, a week ago as I'm recording this, something happened to me personally that inspired me to revisit this theme. So my friend Cody asked me to watch his dog Theo for the night. Theo's a little pomsky and he barks a lot, so when he started barking like crazy at something going on outside, I didn't pay any attention to it besides telling him to be quiet a few times. But when he went to the back door and kept barking, I figured he wanted to go outside. 
So I was going to the back door to open it, but as I got close to the door, I realized someone was trying to open the door from the outside. And then I saw through the screen of the door, there was another guy looking right back at me. This was in the backyard, which was already alarming enough, and he wasn't someone I recognized to be a family member of Cody's. So I asked him who he is, and he responded asking me if I'd seen Melissa. Melissa is Cody's younger sister who's in her 20s. Meanwhile, this guy looked like he was in his mid-50s and homeless. So I told him he needs to leave, there's no Melissa who lives here. And he said, you sure? So I said, yeah, you need to leave, there's cameras all over the property. He left right after that. Getting him to leave was easy, but when Cody asked his sister who that guy could have been, she said she had no idea. The guy looked like he was 55, drunk and filthy. Not exactly someone Cody's 20-something-year-old sister would be associating with. The fact that he went to the back door and tried letting himself in was actually pretty terrifying because you could only imagine what he was trying to do to Melissa, and it's why so many of these stories could be avoided by just keeping your doors locked.